One of my most favorite children's books that I used to read to my little girls is The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. It is about a boy. It is about a tree that unconditionally loves a boy, giving him everything she can, its leaves for him to make a crown and play the king of the forest, its fruits for him to savor, and the comfort of its shade, so that he can rest. The boy loves the tree, but as he grows older, he keeps coming back to her to ask for more. First, money, then a home, then a boat. She doesn't have any of this, but to her detriment, she offers him the food he can sell, the branches he can use to build a home, and eventually its trunk, so that he can build a boat. The tree hopes that he can rest on its stump. The boy does, and she's happy. Or is she? This story resonates with me because it demonstrates beautifully the relationship we have with Mother Nature. For centuries, she has given us unconditionally and generously. But we don't seem to be satisfied, and now we take more than we should. Every year, we kill millions of trees worth between 50 and 150 billion dollars. We make $20 billion in illegal profit by killing and trading in wild animals and plants. And we illegally remove between $16 and $36 billion worth of fish from our oceans. Did you know that one out of every three wild-caught fish we eat in the United States come from unsustainable or illegal sources? Or that every minute our global oceans lose about 100,000 pounds of fish to illegal fishing? If we continue at this rate, by 2050, our global fisheries will have collapsed, which means that 90% of the commercially viable fish will be completely wiped out. Our actions have serious consequences on the natural environment and the animals. Our very own survival as a species depends on the natural world to support us. With every plant and animal disappearing, we will not have the ecosystem services, such as carbon storage, water filtration, uh, retention of floods, that wild animals and plants provide us. And with every disbalance we create through our actions, we will inch closer to the Earth, becoming inhospitable to, and eventually inhabitable for our species. Is this the future we have envisioned for our children? As a conservation crime scientist, my job is to study and prevent crimes against wildlife. Wildlife crime is generally defined as the taking, trading, processing, possessing, and consuming of wild animals and plants in violation of national and international laws. In other words, wildlife crime is the illegal exploitation of the world's animals and plants. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the illegal exploitation of animals. And here is what that exploitation looks like. Endangered and critically endangered animals are sold to private zoos, exotic pet collectors, pet shops, circuses for a very high price. For example, the world's most endangered tortoise, the Golden Dome Plowshare Tortoise, is sold for about $100,000 as a pet. Orangutans are slaughtered so that their babies can be captured and sold as pets for about $20,000. Endangered and critically endangered animal parts, such as fur, feather, and skin, are used to make clothing, wall hangings, carpets, and furniture or decorations. 
For example, the Tibetan antelope, or chiru's wool, is used to make a special type of shawl called shatush. The problem is that about five chirus will have to be killed to make a single shawl. And there are only about 150,000 of them left in the wild. Elephant feet are used to make stools. Tiger, giraffe, zebra skins are used to make wall hangings and carpets. Endangered and critically endangered animal parts are also sold as gifts, special gifts or souvenirs to tourists. And this may include statuettes, good luck charms, jewelry made of uh, elephant ivory, seahorses, corals, starfish, you name it. Endangered and critically endangered animals are also eaten into extinction as delicacies or as bushmeat or wild meat. And this may include birds, such as the yellow-breasted bunting, fish, such as bluefin tuna, totoaba swim bladder or shark fins, mammals, such as pangolins, snow leopards or bear paws, reptiles, such as turtles and snakes, and primates, such as chimps and gorillas. And lastly, endangered and critically endangered animals are killed so that their parts can be used in traditional Asian medicine, even though many traditional medicine practitioners have already distanced themselves from animal-based remedies. For example, tiger bone is used to treat pains, strengthen muscles and bones. Rhino horn is used to treat arthritis or high blood pressure. Pangolin scale is used to improve lactation and treat arthritis. And bear bile is cruelly extracted from live bears to treat gallbladder and liver conditions. As a conservation crime scientist, my approach to wildlife crime is anchored in the crime science perspective. Crime science refers to the scientific study of crime and its prevention. Our job is to study the here and the how of the crime event so that we can devise prevention strategies to deal with them. The here refers to the places where crime is likely to happen, and the how refers to the environmental conditions necessary for that crime to happen. Crime scientists know that crime is always likely to happen where the opportunities are the highest and where motivated offenders make rational decisions that aim to benefit themselves. After crime scientists have carefully studied the crime event, they devise evidence-based crime prevention strategies that can use the, so what we call the situational crime prevention techniques. These techniques collectively aim to increase the risk of committing the crime, increase the effort, reduce the reward, reduce the provocations, and remove the excuses. Conservation crime scientists like myself have used various types of crime science techniques and methods to study different types of wildlife crime, such as elephant, parrot, rhino poaching, illegal fishing, and redwood pearl poaching. I study wildlife crimes because I am well aware of the serious consequences it can lead to if nothing is done to stop it. And here are some examples of how these crimes relate to all of us and reasons why we should all care. First, wildlife crimes almost never occur in isolation and are carried out alongside other very serious crimes and sometimes by very dangerous criminals. Wildlife traffickers use intimidation, violence, and sometimes deadly force to facilitate their activities. For example, the Janjaweed militia groups in Sudan are known to be involved in the trafficking of ivory. 
the Japanese crime syndicate, such as the Yakuza, is known to be involved in the trafficking of elephant ivory, rhino horn, and shark fins. Do we want to empower them with our inaction? Second, wildlife crimes have serious human costs. In Africa alone, about 1,000 park rangers have been killed in line of duty in the past decade alone. And about 80% of them have been killed by poachers and armed militia groups. Illegal fishing vessels often recruit crew from developing countries, sometimes referred to as the sea slaves or the de facto prisoners of the sea. These men are trafficked to work 18 hours a day on illegal fishing vessels and often subjected to physical and verbal abuse. Children are also recruited from poverty-stricken communities to work on these illegal fishing vessels and are often subjected to brutal beatings, sexual violence, and exposed to life-threatening experiences. Do we want to continue witnessing passively what's going on? Third, wildlife crimes have significant environmental impacts. Bottom trolling is one of the most destructive methods used to capture bottom-dwelling commercial fish, such as cod, whiting, flounder, as well as shrimp and crabs. And this involves the use of wide nets uh, with metal rollers attached to them that are dragged across the seafloor, killing everything along its way, crushing corals and kelp forests. We simply cannot passively witness the destruction on, of the environment on which we depend for survival as a, as a species. Next. Wildlife criminals carry out their activities using very cruel methods. For example, snakes and alligators are skinned alive. The vaquita, the world's most endangered marine mammal species, of which there are only nine left in the wild as I speak, drown in nets cast to capture a critically endangered fish, totoaba. Sharks' fins are cut, and sharks are thrown back into the ocean to suffer a slow death. Birds trafficked as pets die of malnourishment, dehydration, broken bones, and lesions en route to their destination. In fact, about 80% of them never make it. And tiger cubs are drugged so that we can take pictures with them. Lastly, wildlife crimes have serious health and safety implications. Monkeys trafficked as pets can carry such diseases as yellow fever, Kazanur forest disease, and malaria. Ebola has been linked to our consumption of wild meat. And now there is a general consensus in the scientific community that the novel coronavirus that caused COVID-19 jumped from bats into humans through the Malayan pangolin. Now, you may say, wow, I didn't know, and all you have said is terrible. I hope you will ask, what can I do? Because there is a lot we can all do. We should continue educating ourselves, become informed consumers, and hold ourselves accountable for the choices we make. Remember, our demand drives wildlife crime. Our demand for exotic foods, our demand for clothing made of uh, animal parts, our demand for exotic pets, our demand for decorative items, you name it. In fact, the United States is one of the biggest markets of illegal wildlife 
in the world. So this trade is mainly driven by us, the U.S. consumers. We need to make sustainable choices and avoid products that endanger wildlife. For example, before you buy fish, you can consult the so-called good fish guides produced by Marine Stewardship Council, Seafood Watch, or any other marine sustainability promoting organization. We should avoid products that endanger wildlife, wild animals. By all means, avoid products that are made of animal parts. Before you buy anything, check if the product you buy contains palm oil, because vast areas of critically endangered animals, such as pygmy elephant, the Sumatran rhino, or the orangutan, are wiped out to make room for palm plantations. Next time you travel abroad and are offered a trinket at a local market, inquire, what is this made of? Is this legal? Or if you have been given the opportunity to take a picture with an elephant, a slow loris, or a tiger in captivity, ask yourself, is by any way my action contributing to the cruelty with which these animals are being treated? Is what I'm doing moral and ethical? Most importantly, spread the word. Become advocates for environmental justice. Lead by example. Every single one of you has the power and the voice to make a difference. Use your power. Use your voice. Make choices that matter. Make choices that are just. A dear friend of mine, Arusiak Turabian, gave the giving tree to my little girl, and I would like to conclude with her words. May you find your giving tree and be a giving tree without taking too much or giving away too much of yourself. Thank you.